I love, love, love that song. I think I told you guys already. Uh, John Kella is my producer when it comes to beats for AfricanMusicLaw.com podcast show. And I so appreciate that when I came and told him, John, I need a little bit of a, you know, switch things up a bit. Every time I hear the beat, I want to be able to rock to it. He delivered. And every time I hear the beat for African Music Law opening, uh, I always just get to dance it. So thank you so much, John Keller. Shout out to him. A hashtag at Incredible916. So check him out on all uh, your various social media platforms. If you're a musician or anyone else looking for great beats, he's the person to plug you in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show. So happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure spending quality time every Sunday as we bring dynamic guests or legal commentary and, and, and news and analysis on Africa's entertainment industry. Let me tell you what this platform is all about. We are all about empowering the African artist wherever he or she may be found and the creative industry at large. And to do so, we have several mediums that we use to, to accomplish our goals. Uh, part of it is our interviews. It is also bringing experts on to share their insights on the industry, among so many, many other things. Where can you find us? If you are watching on YouTube, it's one place you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, any major social media platforms. And on the podcast side of things, you can certainly find us on the major streaming platforms. Having said that, uh, of course, go to www.africanmusiclaw.com for any and all things music business and entertainment law news commentary and analysis. I'm so, so excited about my guest today. I know I say that for every single guest, but very much so excited about my guest today, Gary Goldston, who is going to share a remarkable journey, his personal journey, into the business of entertainment, specifically film, and also take us down the trajectory of what it takes to be successful in the business. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to really participate in this. So for the first time, we are streaming on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, leave your comments. I already see comments coming in. And let me pull that comment in. Um, there's LinkedIn user saying hello, 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 LinkedIn user. Um, be sure to have your name so we can see your name uh, and also acknowledge you. So we will be pulling uh, comments from YouTube, Facebook, and all the other platforms that we're live streaming, Twitch, et cetera. So feel free to leave your comments. We'll pull it in. Questions you may have for Gary, please feel free. In case you're not aware of who Gary Goldston is, let me just do a brief intro, although I will really, really uh, unpack it through our conversation. So Gary Goldson is well known for iconic movies such as Pretty Woman, On the Siege, among others. And he is actually uh, one of the leading voices and leading producers in Hollywood. He has done so much in the quality of movies he's put out there. But I think what particularly attracts me to him is the fact that he pours back into the community. So the new generation come in, a pipeline program through what he's created with Creative Edge. And he really does mentor, really gives back. He's an author, he's so much more. Let me just have him come on so we can really, really get into it with him. So Gary Goldson, welcome. Good to have you on the show. How are you? Good How welcome, are you? welcome. I am well. Finally, right? We we officially connect the dots, right? So I it's so so it. good to yes. have you. Welcome, welcome. How are you doing? Let's start off on a Sunday. How are it you doing? is a beautiful, beautiful sun-drenched sun Sunday. Life looks life. pretty beautiful to me. That is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So um, I generally get up early, have a whole routine on my morning, um, you know, routine, even on Sundays. And I'm sort of curious what your typical routine is, especially on a Monday. I mean, on a Sunday, sorry. Uh, well, Sunday, you know, I love I love the weekend because I, I consider it an uninterrupted time. You know, some of the greatest people in the world, historically, very successful, brilliant minds, uh, they talk about how they sort of protect their, their regimen, their schedule, their personal needs. And one of the things that always shows up is like leave lots of room for reading and contemplation. Um, I always start my day quietly. I don't have a lot of sound, a lot of music or any of that right away. And I definitely run down and, and I, I live by the beach. So I'm always near water and I'm usually mm. in water. It's just a sort of wonderful way to greet the day. Mm. Just time to think before I connect up with digital or other, you know, inputs. 
So for me, it's a, it's a little bit about, you know, like, gosh, what do I want this day to be? What am I grateful for? Enjoying nature, feeling good physically. Uh, and, and then of course, you know, coming back to, uh, the, the altar of my espresso machine. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to finally wake up. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, that is amazing. And you know, I like how you talk about before you even get connected to digital. That's so hard for a lot of people these days. So how do you um, have or how have you created that self-discipline and not even quickly take the phone and, and start checking it out? You know, it's honestly, it took a little conscious doing because we are creatures of habit. And we just get into a pattern where um, it's reflexive. You know, we're so connected to our devices and uh, it's, it, we're not even, it, it, oftentimes I catch myself or others when we speak, you hear people say, you know, or like, they're constantly peppering it in. They're not even aware they're doing it. And that's what a lot of our habits are. They're just reflexive. We're not even necessarily conscious that we're doing that. But I decided that I wanted to be very conscious about how I start my day because it really does set the tone. It does. It does. Um, and and um, I found that I was more harried, more hectic, a little more yeah. anxious if I didn't just take control of the canvas of my life. Uh, so I just started paying attention and I had to deal with myself like for, you know, like 10 days in a row. I'm just going to literally notice and be aware in the moment of my choices and what am I doing and how do I want to alter them? And it just became sort of this seamless dance of what do, what do I really want? What does my spirit want? Mm -hmm. not, not what is, you know, from here up, put that aside. What does my spirit want? And that, that just was sort of how I redesigned my approach to um, early morning. I love the question of what does my spirit want? And I want to get to a point where you finally arrive at that profound question on a daily basis for your life. So let's go back to the beginning all the way. Um, in, in doing my research, preparing for this interview, uh, one of the things that struck me was how amazing it will be to talk about the East Coast, the West Coast, and then sort of the global viewpoint that you bring to the table. So my understanding is your beginning start all the way in the Bronx. So tell us a little bit about that and when you, your family ultimately migrated to the West. Well, yeah, I left when I was very young. I was, I was born in New York and my father's family was, um, they were all in New York. Um, my mother's family were all West Coast folks, generations of San Franciscans. Um, so I was born in New York, and, but we, I, was, I was very young. I was 10 years old when my parents took my brother and myself, picked us up and moved 3,000 miles away. And that was, a, you know, it was a great time. It was the 60s. Uh, in San Francisco. So it was like the time of, you know, the, I mean, musically, if you love, I know you love music, I love music, and Thanks. we'll get into that. But Absolutely. it was such a delicious time to be in the San Francisco Bay Area for for every reason imaginable. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the poet, opened City Lights Bookstore, North Beach, the, you know, the city was so alive culturally, um, not just musically. So it was a really interesting time when you came to that age of real abiding curiosity to not be in the sort of uh, the outbackers, you know, almost suburban area of New York, but more um, in, in, in this like vibrant, closely knit city that was San Francisco, the city on a hill. Uh, and, and, and really just, and by the way, you know, where I was, I wasn't from the Bronx. I was actually born on Long Island. Oh, okay. All okay. right. So that's a really different vibe. Back then, mm -hmm. it was it was rural. The cities weren't connected. You, you know, one town you drove to get to the next town. A lot of open space, mm -hmm. but it was also very, um, you know, like I when I came to San Francisco and I entered sixth grade and I went to the school and I was surrounded by, you know, Filipinos, Asians of yeah. every type and. <laughs> Very diverse. Like literally, it was it was like a rainbow of humanity that I'd never experienced, uh, it, let alone in such you know immediate and diverse and 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 you know I was like, oh my god, I was like a kid in a candy store. So it was literally like, who are we? Who are you? You know, 
Uh, so it was on every level, San Francisco just like exploded um, my understanding of life. Um, mm. And it was just a, you know, I was very, I was very blessed. Um, and then I went to um, my freshman year at Berkeley was the year that, you know, our generation back then, our job, we knew it going in was to end a war and unseat a president. And we mm -hmm. in fact did that amidst a lot of tumult, a lot of chaos, a lot of riots. Um, uh, at, at the, and I was at sort of at the epicenter at the UC Berkeley campus. Well, well, we'll get to that. Let, let's really take our time with the storytelling for sure. sure. Uh, and that's very, that's very interesting to me as well uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk about that. But let's back up a little bit to um, you went to a magnet school, Lowell High School. You can't be in San Francisco. I, I went to grad school at UC Hastings uh, among the law schools I ended up attending. And one of the things that you could not ignore when you went to San Francisco was practically every local person there, at least at the school, and then just generally Laurel High School always came up um, because of the quality of graduates, among other things. So what was that experience like? A public school, but still um, very, very, um, you know, elite school, if you will. Uh, well, what was that experience going to a magnet school, specifically Laurel High School? Yeah, I, I, I think it was a... It was the best of times, worst of times. Mm. It was the best of times because I was introduced to things that I, I, I mean, I might have been, uh, but I, I, I don't think I had, I, th I think I was introduced to people and, and learnings and opportunities that may or may not have existed for me otherwise. Um, you know, the, the one that really stands out, one of the early courses I took uh, was a creative writing course that was taught by a woman who was absolutely brilliant and really sort of said, you know, like she opened doors for me intellectually, emotionally, and otherwise that felt such a right size fit for who I am as a human being. Even at that young age, I knew it. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, there were things and, but at the same time, I was just this painfully shy kid. Like I was the kid, I would never raise my hand in school. I didn't want to be seen or noticed. I was, uh, I was a, you know, I was, I was that kid who fell in love with story and books at a very young age. And I was very content on my own in that bubble. Uh, and I wasn't, you know, I liked people. I was fascinated by people, but I was, I didn't know my place. I really didn't have a, a strong sense of self at the beginning. And so I was so shy that going to a high school where I didn't have, I wasn't surrounded by the people I understood as friends and to be thrown into this, you know, it was literally across the, the other end of the city and a commute and strangers. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was in this world where I really didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that was, that was really uncomfortable. So I dove deeper into the story into the creative writing, into those those mentors who and teachers uh, who opened those doors for me. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, so interesting. We do have something in common, fell in love with books at an early age, uh, storytelling, et cetera. But the difference is I've always been an extrovert personality. I, I say it's a middle child syndrome because, you know, middle children are just at least the ones I've met. Hello, hello, I'm here, I'm here. So that's interesting that uh, in contrast for you, it was it was different. So yeah. let's transition, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I have one older brother who I adore and love. And back then he was he was the, the really explosive 4th of July rock and ship <laughs> energy, right? Uh, yeah. Acting out in every direction. And I was sort of the opposite. I was like holding the space, the peacekeeper, the, you know, <laughs> the, the calm, quiet one, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not that person today necessarily, but it was certainly what my mark, all my years growing up. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So let's transition to um, college, Berkeley, and um, so many things going on with the Berkeley side of things that the activism you talk about, but also always it appears having that mentality and mindset of organization skill set and being able to see the big picture you got into music you you were one of the youngest music execs working 
while still going to school. So tell us, unpack that a little bit more and how that, that came to be. Yeah, it's interesting because when I, when I thought about going to college, um, I literally applied to only one school, UC Berkeley. I, I was almost like I knew my destiny, my dharma was to be there. Mm. My, brother, my brother went to Stanford where most members of my family, my mother had gone, that's where my parents met. Um, and, um, but it literally, it registered zero on the meter for me. Like I had, there was nothing that called to me except Berkeley. And uh, so when I did get it, it admitted, I was ecstatic. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 when I got there, the, they had this beautiful new, um, I was, I, I, I mean, growing up as a teen, I was deeply involved in the music scene. It was Hippies and Hells Angels. I was out every night at the clubs. I, like music was really, had become my thing at the time. Um, and I sort of, you know, like that was the one thing about leaving, going across the Bay to Berkeley where, oh gosh, where's the music scene here? Well, there was a brand new 3000 seat venue called Zellerback Auditorium. And of course, all these lesser, physically smaller venues. And I just one day, despite being a shy kid, I walked in this long hair sort of hippie kid and I walked into the admin building and I said, hey, who produces all your music? And they said, well, we don't really have such a thing. And I said, well, how about you do? And uh, so a, a, a friend of mine and I, he was a year, uh, a year or two ahead of me in, in school. Anyway, we came together and we decided we were together going to be the music chairman of the UC Berkeley campus. Mm. And, they, and they said, great, bring, you know, do it. So we um, had access to um, you know, freedom to produce all these artists and bring them on campus. And, and that's really the, honestly, that's the reason Columbia Records, which then back then was the big lion of the labels. They had mm -hmm. so, so much bench depth of these art, you know, just amazing artists. And they wanted their artists on our stages. And so they um, pulled me in as, as, as a and &R. Um, you know, which was basically greet the artists when they're in town, put them on in concert, uh, go to the record stores, make sure we're st fully stocked. It was it was not a &R in the traditional definition. Got it. Got it. Got it. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you would think then the natural progression would be uh, ultimately to, to, to segue into the music business, especially having that those connections, that relationship, the sense of the industry and you know, what young people were listening to and what they wanted, what happened? <laughs> you, know, you, didn't, was, you didn't end up in music. I thought I would. There was a brief window, a moment in time when all the major labels thought, oh my gosh, San Francisco is going to be the next great music outpost. They're, and they all went up there for some reason. I don't know why. They just had this idea at the same time and they all opened offices up there uh, right on the waterfront. It was beautiful. Um, including Columbia Records. And um, that only lasted uh, several years. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, San Francisco was not, <clears throat> was a great music town, but not a music business town. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so um, I was close enough that I actually got to see the inside of the music business while they had all these beautiful offices up there and all these executives and whatever. And I would go across the bay and hang out with them and sit in on some of these staff meetings and other meetings. And um, I was such a, a, a dreamer, such an idealist, such a romantic. And when I would sit in these meetings, I just, I felt like a stranger in a strange land. I felt like mm. I didn't recognize this community. This was not my tribe. My tribe was over there on, on the campus across the water. And, um, so I, I just decided that this was not an industry I wanted to be a part of. I love the artists. I've always loved artists. I've loved the storytellers, but I didn't like the business. And I think I was very naive, uh, you know, had I gone into it and just sort of uh, got, gotten used to that. Um, my, my, life, my life trajectory might have been very, very different. I don't know, but, but I didn't. Hmm. Very interesting. So speaking of your life trajectory, uh, at some point, you decide to pursue law and become a lawyer. What informed that decision? Um, 
two things. Um, you know, back then it was a very different time as, as you can well imagine. And we didn't have the word entrepreneur and you know, we, it was a much more, it was, it was, it, I know it was not that many years ago, but it might as well have been a century ago. Um, so we, you know, our job as hippies coming out of that movement, if you will, you had sort of two choices. You go into academia or you save the world. That's a job. Pick a category. And I knew I didn't want to be in academia. That just was not for me. So I really wanted to save the world. And it's my disposition. It was like, I love people. I love helping people. I want to, I want to do something good. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. So truthfully, after college, I... I sort of was a, a lost soul bumbling around, taking different jobs for, for a couple of three years before I went to law school. But a couple of years after law school, I was talking to someone. I said, I really, I, I also didn't feel very much like I was connected as an adult to the world. Hmm. Um, and <clears throat> hold on I, one second. Why do you think that was? Um, I think I had developed such a wonderful sense, you know, I was, I, I, I had such muscularity as a daydreamer and as a, an introvert. Now, I, I don't want to say introvert because I really did love people, but as a daydreamer and someone who got lost in story and um, I didn't see where that fit anywhere on the landscape uh, outside of my college life. I couldn't see myself in that frame. Um, so the more I thought about it, I realized, well, I, you know, I, I actually have a, a couple of different sets of heroes, two, two in particular. Uh, and the first hero were, uh, was, was a man named William Kunstler. And William Kunstler was a criminal defense, you know, he was a defense attorney um, who defended free speech. And he uh, is it featured in the, the, you know, there was a film just released in the last, I believe it was year about the Chicago seven and he was the attorney and he was, so I, I thought he was a God. He was like out there doing righteous work for on all our behalves, um, to make this a better country. And, um, so I, he was, he was one of my true heroes back then. Um, and he was my inspiration to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, because also to me, the courtroom was a theater. And if you didn't tell a persuasive story, if you weren't good at telling a great story, something bad would happen. So there were a number of energies and, and, I, and ideas behind that, but um, I decided, you know what, this is really where I belong. I need to go to law school. Well, along the way, <clears throat> pardon me, I was introduced, someone said, you know, there's this foundation out in this part of San Francisco, which you may well know, Baby Hunters yeah. Point, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, just a beautiful community, but beset with so many problems um, uh, back in the day. And uh, this foundation was, um, you know, in this ramshackle develop redevelopment buildings, and 125 people who were uh, there was a criminal defense unit, and those lawyers were chartered to uh, represent the indigent adults of this community in lieu of the public defender. But they also had drug counseling programs and they had job re you know, skills training programs and they had social workers. They had pretty much the whole, um, the, the idea was this holistic approach to solving the problems of the community, keeping the kids in school, the families together, men out of jail, et cetera. Um, and I went out there and um, I'd never been there. You know, I was, I was really, this was like a, a big adventure for me. And when I got out there, they didn't know what to do with me. I grabbed hold of someone's coattails, this poor guy. Um, I just grabbed his coattails quite literally. And I said, I want to work here. I just blurted it out. <clears throat> and he said, well, are you a lawyer? And I'm a young, long haired guy. No, I'm not a lawyer. He said, are you a, a law student? I said, no, I'm not in law school yet, but I want to go. And he looked at me and shrugged like, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> um, and, 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 and he said to me, so, you know, listen, why don't you come back next Tuesday during our staff meeting and everyone will be here and you can meet everybody. And which was really his way of politely saying, saying, yeah, <laughs> be gone. Don't waste my time. Um, and, and so thinking I'd never come back. And I, of course, I showed up 
And I, I wouldn't leave. I just stayed. And I said, look, um, I don't care if you pay me or don't pay me. This I'm meant to be here. This is where I need to be. Um, and, you know, and, and then I met some of these people in the staff meeting that the, the, the head counsel, lead counsel was this very tall African-American. He had the voice of like James Earl Jones. It shook the earth. And he had been a leader in the civil rights, a civil rights leader in the South before LBJ coined the phrase civil rights. He was, mm. he'd been a president and NAACP president. He was, he had seen and done things. I just, I wanted to like be close to him. Mm. I wanted mm -hmm. to learn from him, even though he scared me. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I, I sort of begged and I said, look, I'm not leaving, I, I, I please. And they said, okay, fine. So mm -hmm. I became a free intern. I worked for a year. They taught me more in that year about life, about criminal law, about everything. Um, and I and I sort of became, you know, like I was living long days, seven days, you know, almost seven days a week uh, in the Bayview Hunters Point area. And just suddenly, like, it, it, it I don't know, I found my family in a way. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, That's so profound to say that. Yeah, it was, you know, there was a gal. So here's the deal. I was rejected from law school. Mm. I got a letter. And I, I'm out in Baby Hunter's Point one day with this very long, sad boy look. And these attorneys come in and they go, what's with the, the face? And I just, oh, you know, I couldn't even speak. I was so sad. Pity party. I hand them the letter. They read the letter. They say, oh, my gosh. Um, well, you know what? Look, we have court. We all have to go to court. You stay here. Do not leave because we need you this afternoon. Don't dare leave. And I said, OK, OK, OK. I, I'm just going to sit here and mope all day. So they leave. And I think they're in court arguing cases. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did was they these three attorneys canceled all their court dates, got continuances, went home, were already in suits, put on their very best suits went downtown to the to Golden Gate University, cornered the dean of the law school, this woman, Judy McKelvey, <laughs> and they said, do you know who we are? And, and she said, you're legendary, of course, you're better than a TV series, we know who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, well, you're, you're the dean, do you have wild card admissions? And she said, yes. And they said, write down this name. They told my, <laughs> they said my name, she wrote it down. And they looked at her and I said, do, is he officially uh, admitted? admitted. <laughs> and she said, apparently, yes. Yes, he is. And that's how I got into law. So anyway. Wow. Your voice is. I have to tell you my own back end story later on in the green room, but it's a, it's a very different story. I was headed to L.A., Loyola, admitted to all kinds of schools. But then two weeks prior to Hastings, meet the dean person and make the long story short. He's like, no, you have to go to our school. Forget everybody else. Our school is the school. So, so interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, more details later, um, later on in the green room. But yeah. wow. So, and, so fascinating. Yeah, no, it was really interesting. So halfway through the first year of law school, there was a woman who was also a full-time first year law student named Rosario Bacon. Uh, also African-American, uh, single mother of two boys, MSW degree, full-time social work practice to support her family. Mm -hmm. Full-time social work, full-time mother, full-time first-year law student. I was so overwhelmed by her. It was like, who is this superwoman that she can do this? I'm barely treading water. Uh, we became friends and... Um, I just had no end of respect for her. And we became friends. And at one point she came to me and said, you know, the, the people out at Bayview Hunters Point, it was almost mythic. They had such a legendary reputation. Um, amongst other things, and you'll appreciate this as an attorney, they had a simple policy. If you find Mr. District Attorney, it was a mystery at the time. If you find a member of our community worthy of being charged with a crime, no matter how small or large, from felony misdemeanor, Here's what we'll tell you. We'll see you in court. We never plea bargain ever. Wow. That's what, a, what a shift. Yeah, it was huge. And it was inviolable. We would mm. never negotiate. Um, and we had better attorneys and we had the back of our community had our back and we had theirs. So we always knew more than they knew. 
and we never lost cases. I, wow. I say we, they, right? Um, and so they, there was this sort of almost overly romantic, larger than life reputation. So Rosario comes to me one day at law school and says, Gary, and she, I, she was not a shy retiring person. She was a big energy, but she was kind of shy. And she came to me and said, could you know these people? Could you, could I, I'd like to meet them. Can you take me there one day? And I said, yeah, absolutely. We're going on a Tuesday staff meeting day. You're going to meet everybody. Mm -hmm. And we went out and we spent a few hours. I introduced her to as many people as were there. And we hung out and I actually included her in the staff meeting. It was, you know, fine. And um, we get in my little Carmen Gia Volkswagen to head back downtown to the law school. And she's dead silent. And I, I've never experienced that with her. So a few, a few, a few stoplights later, I was getting uncomfortable and I turned to her and I said, Rosario, is everything okay? You're very quiet. And she slowly turned to me and she, the, she, it was like she was speaking in slow motion, like she was thinking it deeply as she said it. And she just said, turned to me and said, those people really love you. Oh, it's amazing. And it took a second for it to sort of soak in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a beautiful chapter of my life. Um, it wasn't the right career choice for me, but it was, but it was, in, it was, it was a perfect choice for me at that time. Yeah, and you know, when you say that it wasn't the right career choice for you, I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners come to that crossroad where they're like, this has been great, but it's just not a fit. And then having the courage to actually follow through with a new path can be so intimidating and overwhelming. So for you, at what point did you decide it's not the career choice for me and I'm going to pivot and go Hollywood style? Um, you know, there were two things I would share with you. Uh, one is that, I, I mean, I knew, I knew that it was too harsh a world that I was emotionally beaten up every night. I probably would have arrived there on my own, but something happened, if I'm very honest with you, which is that the woman that I was in love with at the time was the victim of an extremely brutal attempted rape. Oh, wow. She was beaten so badly. Um, and I got a call one night, uh, very, very late, and said, come down to the police emergency hospital, Don is here. And I, I would say it's the first time in my life or maybe the only time in my life for about 72 hours that I was, I was probably clinically across the line. Um, I think I was a bit crazy and it, I was so upset. And um, we caught, they caught the guy, but her spirit was really broken. It mm -hmm. really just did so, I'd never seen that level of damage emotionally. And um, so, you know, without getting into the depths of that, um, that was it. Like in that moment, I knew I could not be a defense attorney. Mm. Just couldn't do it. It became metaphoric, if not literal, that people hurting people in any way, shape or form was not okay. And I really didn't want to be investing my energies in that. So. I went to my dad, that's piece number one. Piece number two is I went to my dad, who was my, my you know, one of my heroes, certainly. And um, we we're very close. And I, I, I nervously, because his opinion meant everything. And I went to my dad and I said, we need to, come on, I'm taking you from your place of business. We gotta go sit and have some lunch or coffee or whatever. And I stuttered and stammered and finally confessed to him that I was quitting a job, but that really the truth is I wasn't quitting a job. I was quitting a career. And that's why it was, I was so nervous. And he, the second I got it out of my mouth, my father got this huge smile. And he said one word, he said, great. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that. What does that mean? And he said, I don't think you've been happy. I think you should go find whatever it is that excites you in life. And whatever that is, go do that. And it was like, oh my gosh, you are so ahead of your generation. Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like Zen Master Gaudi. Um, so, so 
you know, I thought about it and I thought, you know, I know, I know what's always lit me up mm. um, and I'm going to go pursue that. Um, and, and I didn't, you know, my hero, my other hero that I talked about earlier was Max Perkins, greatest editor, you know, discovered and launched the careers of Faulkner, Hemingway, Ring Lardner, Thomas Wolfe, so many great. And, but I didn't want to be in publishing. I didn't want to be that it, it, it wasn't, I, I loved the visual arts. I loved not being, um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to work um, in such a secluded environment as publishing at that time. So uh, I, I ran away to Hollywood and didn't know anyone in LA, didn't, didn't know a stitch about the business, didn't know even what the job titles were, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I just had this, you know, naive belief that you work hard um, and most importantly, you spend your time meeting people and making everyone your friend and mentor. And that eventually you'll sort of figure it out. Um, uh, so let's let's put a pin in it and let me do a quick reintroduction for those that have just joined us. And then we'll get into that whole other career trajectory in Hollywood, produced in Pretty Woman, Under Siege, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for just joining us. My name is Miss Uduak, host of the AfricanMusicLaw.com show. My guest today is Gary Goldston, and we are talking about what it takes to be successful in Hollywood. But before getting there, two tracks, addressing first his personal trajectory, and then of course, getting into his career trajectory. We've got into how it all started, from being born to high school, grade school, high school, college, uh, discovering the creative arts, among other things, life's philosophy. And we're getting ready to segue into talking about his career in Hollywood. Before we do that, I wanna invite you, if you are, um, if you have any questions, et cetera, please feel free to leave your comments, regardless of what platform you're watching this. We'll be able to pull that in through the comment section and we'll certainly be able to read that uh, to Gary or ask any questions you may have. Having said that, going back to you, Gary, so let's let's start beginning to unpack this Hollywood thing. Major traumatic life experience happens and you say, nope, not defense work anymore. By the way, we also share something in common because uh, I did a lot of criminal defense work as well. Uh, came about because I wanted to do a lot of trials and people kept saying, if you want to do trials, you've got to do criminal work first. And certainly eye opening, I think a lot of, um, like you, a lot of philosophical life experiences and, and moments come into play when you do that kind of work. Um, so now you pivot, you decide, okay, where I'm headed is actually going to the creative arts, really leaning in, embracing it. You pack everything and move to Hollywood. Start from the beginning of what that experience was about, especially I'm sure a lot of creatives are now in the industry, Hollywood specifically taking keen notes on, on your process. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I arrived, I, um, I'll tell you the first thing I did. First of all, I came from, you know, the, the old saw that, you know, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So, you know, the foggy, foggy, cool San Francisco, I was in sunny, warm LA and I joined an outdoor health club. And the reason I did that was not so much because I needed a place to exercise or play tennis or swim, although that was good. Uh, but I needed a place to meet people. And I figured that the, the majority of people who were there Monday through Friday in the middle of, of the work week were probably freelance creatives. They're people who um, are probably the very people I would like to begin having a conversation with. And it turned out to be true. So I would spend, that would became my office for the first year. I literally lived there. I would play tennis. I would play paddle tennis. I swim. But wherever I was, whether I was on a court or by the pool, I would always ask people, "Who are you? What do you know? What do you do?" And and uh, and and I would sit them down after and say, "Would you be my five minute mentor? Would you be my you know six point two minute mentor?" And I have a couple of questions. And that I literally over the course of a year made literally hundreds of new you know what I would call friendships. And I would say of those, actually, a significant num number of them were they were real friendships because we, they were re recidivist. Right. They were repetitive. And we really got to know each other. And they were very kind because I was I, I my whole approach was to be totally vulnerable and honest and transparent. And like I'm the turnip that just fell off the truck. 
I know I, you know, like I know less than what I think I know. I know nothing. Um, and I really would appreciate some of your nuggets of wisdom from you. If you were, you know, like I, here's my background. I don't want to be an attorney. I know how to represent people, but I don't really want to climb a corporate ladder. I don't want to be in a big agency. I, I kind of want to do my own thing. Um, and anyway, so I had hundreds of these conversations and it was, and I started reading scripts. People would give me scripts to read. <clears throat> and so I spent the first year literally networking morning till night, seven days a week, reading scripts, uh, just absorbing all the information that I could. And within that year, I made a decision. And that decision, after many conversations and very a lot of helpful humans, uh, was, oh, there's this thing called management. Back then, it was just for actors primarily. But I decided, no, I don't want to, you know, like I like actors, but I want to work with writers and directors and hyphens. Mm. So um, I'm going to do a literary management firm, which now today is very common, but back then it wasn't. And I started, I started my own firm and rented an office and hired an assistant and, you know, all that good stuff. And, um, and went back out on the tennis court and said, I, I actually am a literary manager. It's funny. You're a writer. I represent people just like you. And they go, you do? Oh my God, <laughs> I, I need to know you. And so it wasn't hard to get clients because there's so many unrepresented clients. It's true. Even till today. True. Yeah. Side. You know, I would say that I kind of, my, 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 that was my graduate school or my, you know, whatever. It probably took me almost three years to really begin to get my hands around this and understand, <clears throat> you know, what, a, what a writer's deal looks like um, to get to know the executives at the, the indies and the studios to, you know, really understand how to break a script down and fix story and, you know, really understand story structure on a subtle, soft anatomy level, right? Um, so many different things, that so many languages you need to speak and different moving parts. But after, you know, a couple of three years, I, I felt like, oh, I, I'm on terra firma. I know what I'm doing here. And I got really good at breaking, not only recognizing where the real talent was and re realigning my list, but also figuring out how to break them in. How do you introduce them in a way that is, is, saves years and, and is very effective uh, and alluring to people? And I just, I, it just became sort of second nature. And it was really a survival mechanism. Like mm. I, if I wasn't going to starve, I needed to figure out how to get these people to earn. Um, and, and, and I just think also I'm, a, you know, I, I, I observe, well, I think I'm uh, somewhat empathetic. I think I'm a people, you know, I love being other focused and asking questions. And I just sort of figured it out for me. Um, and I, and I did, I was able to fortunately break a lot of, you know, TV directors and TV writers and film writers and, and get people in the game and sell scripts and get people jobs, um, to the point where it was a real business. Uh, and it was like, oh my God, this actually works. This is great. Um, and that was good up until the writers went on strike in 1988 and it shut the whole of Hollywood production down, film and television. At which point, and I know we all knew that it was gonna be um, a, a severe strike. It wasn't gonna be a month or two. It was gonna be almost a year. And it was almost a year. Wow. Um, so I went to one of my then clients, uh, this young guy, um, uh, which is another wonderful story for another time, but, um, I said, why don't you dust off when, it, you know, let, let's go off and make a film. You've always wanted to direct, but you haven't. I've wanted to produce, but I haven't. Or I flirted with the idea. Let's make use of this time because we can't just sit around. Um, so uh, long story short, I raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, we went off and made a, uh, gosh, it was guerrilla making at its dumbest. Um, we made every mistake known to man and woman. Um, we just had no idea what we were doing. So we were free in a sense. Uh, and we, 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 I, from the day that I got the money, 
we had four weeks till we were supposed to be in Utah at the Sundance Institute with the script that became Pretty Woman. It was called 3000. But I'd gotten that admitted to the production lab at Sundance and we had a, a specific date. So I turned to him and I said, you know, why don't we, we'll make this film. I've got the money. We'll make the film when we get back from Sundance. And he said to me, nah, let's make it before we go so we don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. said, oh, okay. Uh, we, I mean, literally the two of us, you know, so we had four weeks. Uh, we had two weeks of prep, one 11 days of shoot and three days of edit. And we got on a plane and left and we did deliver the film. And it was a, a comedy of errors. Um, uh, but we did complete a, an adorable film. Um, and, um, and, and most importantly, got the bug. You know, I, I, I really saw, oh my gosh, what a huge, beautiful challenge is this idea of storytelling on the big screen and to be sort of the conductor, to be a producer and not just the representative in the service of someone else's career, but to be able to champion younger talent while being a producer. And so that was the, uh, that was the moment I started to dissolve the company, the management mm -hmm. in favor of producing. Okay. And I think at the tail end of our time together, I want to get into the business of producing. So the back end structural side of things for those that may be interested, but let's get into Pretty Woman. I mean, that is a conversation that has survived decades since its production and ultimate exhibition and everything else. It's a global iconic movie on the siege, among other things that you've done. Um, but I think so many amazing memories from anyone, certainly myself included. I even revisited the movie again and remembered exactly, you know, all the fun mem memories when I saw it um, back then and watched it a gazillion times over. So why don't we talk about that particular script, bringing that to life, and then ultimately just having collectively over a billion dollar in revenue from the kind of work you've been doing. And then I want to at the tail end, get into how one builds a successful business and and and, and remains relevant because that's always important. Yeah, I mean the 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 writer of that script had been my computer programmer. I bought an early Mac computer and hired him through a, a referred by he was referred by a friend. Um, so he he lived in my office for several weeks and helped program my first uh, computer. And as we talked, he was. Um, I discovered that he had fall, uh, dropped out of law, uh, dropped out of film school, and was a writer. Had written a number of screenplays that no one had read. They were stacked in his one bedroom, uh, his one room studio apartment. Um, and I read. I, I volunteered to read them and help him get an agent. And I read. I ended up, long story short, reading three of them. And I and and they were quirky college scripts, but he was super talented. And I finally said to him, you know, forget the idea of an age and I'd like to work with you, but I would like you, if you're willing to write a spec script and I want it to be a classic two-hander that I could cast up if we get lucky. Um, so I want it to be a romance and I want it to take place in a shoebox, a room, no fancy budget need, you know, no big need, need of a big budget. And he came back with the script called 3000, like very quickly. He did it in like eight, 10 weeks, I forget. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was it was obviously that early non-comedic version, um, which when I read it was probably one of the first, by the, at that time, certainly by far the best first draft of any script I'd ever read. It was just a knockout punch. Uh, it was so powerful. Um, and... Um, um, at that point I said, oh my God, you know, you're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be a team. We're going to work together. And, uh, that's what we did. And with that particular project, look, I was new. I wasn't, nobody knew me. <laughs> uh, and, and, and even fewer people knew my writer client. Um, so I decided that we, I needed to make a noise. I needed to shine a light. And uh, I sent the script over to Michelle, this, uh, Michelle Satter, uh, at Sundance, for whom I, I, I give a lot of credit to her, she read it and immediately said, yes, I'm inviting you. I want to invite you to be one of the, I don't know, eight or 10 projects that we bring every year to the Sundance Institute oh, yes. Produ Production Lab. 
and we'll workshop it and we'll have, you know, a level resource people to help you. And I said, great. Um, and the beautiful thing about that was that, um, Hollywood really paid a lot of attention to who got selected by Sundance and it was in the trades and so on. And so the phone started to ring, which never happened before. You know, it was like, I was always dialing out. Now the phone was actually ringing. Um, so that, that, that project was birthed, um, out of this unexpected hiring of a computer programmer. And then this like beautiful gift of being chosen for Sundance um, because that was one of the places I had intentionally said, I need a relationship there. And I'd met Michelle and I just stayed in touch. Um, and um, the, the, the long story, the, you know, long story short, I optioned it to uh, Vestron, which was one of the big robust indie companies, uh, one of the couple of dozen big indie companies back then that brought us Dirty Dancing and all these other wonderful movies. And um, we hit the doldrums and then they were gonna, the company announced they were going to bankrupt, bankruptcy. So I got it in turnaround and I took it and optioned it to another independent company that has since become a huge company back then it wasn't, which was New Regency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so New Regency took it on and kind of we hit the same there, there was this sort of inertia. We just couldn't get it fully financed. We couldn't get it cast. Um, back when it, was, when it was at Vestron, some friends of mine produced Mystic Pizza, a wonderful ensemble indie film. And they had a friends and family screening, and which I, I, which I attended. And I, I said, I have no negative. I have no criticism. It's a beautiful, perfect little film. I, I think it's great. But there's that actress. I don't know her name. But she is Vivian, a character in a film that I'm working on. And would you please introduce me to her? And they said, yeah, happy to introduce you to her. Her name's Julia. OK, great. Long story short, um, even though the film was sort of like sitting idle at New Regency, I got her attached. I, I Well, let, I didn't get her attached. I gave her, I gave Julia and her then representative the script, they read it, they loved it. She volunteered to attach to it um, and was 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 part of, and you know, stayed in that sort of relationship for three years before it ended up getting to and produced to Disney. Um, wow. Along the way, you know, she was relatively unknown, but, but by the time we set it up at Disney, she had shot a film for which she got an Oscar nomination, which was Steel Magnolias, but it hadn't come out. So the world of Hollywood and the world of the American film going public still didn't really still didn't know her. Yeah, know her. Um, but she was attached anyway. So I here's the so here's the deal. You know, like we we know that success requires hard work. We know that we have to know where we want to go. We have to know what direction that where's the North Star. But sometimes how stuff unfolds, it's like so magical that you just have to let go. Uh, and this was just one of those instances because I, I called this fellow that I'd known and he matriculated and he became a, uh, a vice president or senior vice president at Touchstone, which was the sister label to Disney. So I called him and I said, look, I've got this project. It's not available. But the writing is so awesome. You're going to want to hire him. And, and if, if you if if you will read it in the next week, then we'll come out a week from today and we're going to pitch you two Disney appropriate movies. This one, this one has a, a working girl in it. It's not for Disney. Uh, so he said, great. And he read the script. And, and a few days later, the phone rang and they said, we want to buy it. And I was like, I, I just was done. Like, I have no idea what to say to that. Um, and I, I actually questioned if they'd read the right script. Um, <laughs> and, and they said, no, we did. So here's what's beautiful. They did buy it. We had a big meeting. They invited us, you know, we kept the date of the meeting, only it wasn't me and an executive or, or a couple of executives. There were 25 people in the room. Hmm. It was everyone from the chairman, Jeffrey Kass, you know, Jeffrey Kassenberg and the president of the studio and the senior VP and all these executives. It was um, Gary Marshall, the director, and his team. 
It was all of New Regency. It was like this. And then there was a casting director. I looked around the room and it was, she's a top casting director. There's a line producer that has a deal with the studio. What is going on here? Well, it turned out that uh, the uh, Gary Marshall was set to direct a wonderful film, What About Bob? And that film originally wasn't going to be Bill Murray. It was going to star Michael Keaton. His deal had somehow gone off the tracks. I don't know the details, but it did. And that opened up this opportunity. They had Gary Marshall and all these people dressed up for a production and no production. And they thought, well, what if we could lighten the tone of this movie and just sort of slide it in and let Gary direct it and Laura produce it and et cetera. And so they turned to me in this meeting and said, on the Disney lightness scale, this film is a four. We would like it to be a seven. Can you do that? And I immediately, you know, I saw the, everyone in the room staring at me and, and the writer and I, scratched my chin as if I was thinking. Um, and I just looked up at the David, the president, and I said, David, yeah, absolutely. We know exactly how to do that. <laughs> and everybody got jubilant, like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> uh, so we made, the, we made the deal and, uh, you know, and the, and the idea was obvious. Let's, let's turn this from a, but here's the, you know, and, and like, you can't make, you there's no way you could foresee these things, right? That another film would make way for you, uh, that the studio would even see that opportunity. Um, so that's what happened. We lightened the tone, but here's, I mean, I think one of the things that's really special about that film and the writer and I were very, very on board with this. Like there was no resistance. The Yes, the original script was absolutely gorgeous, but this is like, you just got to go with the, you know, the opportunity. And, and, and it was important to me that the original writer that I fight to make sure he got to rewrite it into a comedy to break the back of it that way. So that it's kept its integrity, that it was what it was meant to be. Um, but I also think that interestingly in retrospect, and I wouldn't have said this at the time because I didn't think that way, but in retrospect, I think one of the films that makes that probably one of the most deeply human and soulful romantic comedies of all time, not one of these sort of relentlessly, um, uh, you know, fairy tale and, 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 you know, ultra happy pieces is that it was grounded. The original had some serious subject matter. It had a sex worker, it had conflict and it had so many elements that were of the real adult world. And no matter how messy and how, you know, how it got developed, redeveloped into the comedic version of itself, it didn't lose, it didn't lose that. some of its DNA, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's not an over the top fairy tale. It's actually got this sort of like these anchors that I think are what really helped that film find its place, hit the chords that it hits with people. I mean, yes, it's got that playful, light tone. It's, you know, J Julia, it's you know, yes. <laughs> like her smile alone. I mean, forget about it. Yeah. I mean, she is like a, a you know, a, this radiance on two legs. She's just like hysterical and irresistible. Um, but I think it's the combination mm -hmm. and the contrast. So it's really it's it was it was quite fascinating to see how that unfolded. You know what is what stands out in the segment of what you said so far is is the fact that you say no one really foresees this kind of situation organically taking place, right? So once you let go and let it do do what it does, it comes to you. But that takes me back to sort of the beginning of our conversation on that spiritual side you were talking about. And I'm wondering in this day and age of affirmation, knowing each other, I mean, knowing yourself, doing the inner work. How much of that waking up every day thinking, okay, uh, civil rights attorney, criminal defense work, and now I'm brokering major deals and ultimately churning out, you know, movies that are that now have such global effect and, and have become iconic. How much of that pinch me? I'm this is actually happening to me, and it's supposed to happen to me. That part of it is it's actually supposed to happen to me. Did you embrace? Was that ongoing throughout, or is sort of just innate so it didn't really matter to to do those actions or steps to to 
reinforce what you were receiving? Um, I, you know, no, I mean, I, I don't think I felt that way at all. I, um, I, I, I think there's, there's a level of that zone somewhere between humility and native insecurity that we all have. There's always that moment where you say, was I just lucky? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I can point to a lot of things that I did that engineered that opportunity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but was I just lucky? Um, could I repeat any of this? Do I really know how to produce? Do I, you know, um, do I take credit? For, and I didn't, I didn't really, I, in fact, I didn't even think it was going to be a big, you know, I didn't know it was going to be so successful. I, and it took me a long time for it to really sort of register um, that it was. Um, and um, so I don't, I, you know, I, I, I just, I, my attitude was I've just got to dig in and find the next project. And, you know, it's kind of like every day you got to wake up and start new. Uh, in this business. And every day you have to wake up excited for the possibility of, of, of developing another great story and working with talented people and, um, you know, and not, not relying too much on whatever's happened before. Before, and absolutely. It, it, it's, a, it's a gift from the universe. There's no question. It's, uh, there's, there's a difference between the level of gratitude that I feel for being associated with something that's given that much joy to that many generations around the globe ongoing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's like, oh my God. But it, 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 but it, but it, but it, and it's I'm not to undervalue it, but it's like my best is in front of me. I got to keep moving forward. Um, whether it's film or any other venture, entrepreneurial undertaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good transition to bring the past to the present and really zoom in on that entrepreneurial side. Because I think often we see people be successful, especially on uh, on our screens, but but the tedious aspect of laying out the, the backend infrastructure and having systems and rinsing and repeating those systems, and of course, having the, a great product, talent, et cetera, to ensure success. So let's bring it to the present. The first thing first is how have you managed to stay relevant in the millennial world where we now have streamers, all kinds of uh, really, really evolving, rapidly evolving technological world, um, even on the back end here, right? Learning to use some of these technologies. How have you managed to, to stay relevant before we get into the business infrastructure side of things? Um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I really think about that. I think probably my, one of my greatest drivers and assets and it's just reflexive. It's not something I thought one day I woke up and thought this is how I should be. Mm -hmm. I've just always been like wildly curious. Um, and so I'm, I'm a learner. I'm a, you know, and, and, and so, you know, and technology is just one, one thread in what becomes a rope. Um, it's, you know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not really like, I, I'm, I'm probably not as activist in some ways, you know, like I have all these social media platforms, but do I feed them that as, as rich a meal as many others? No. Um, do I know how to utilize them? And do I, you know, but I also, um, so I think part of it is just being curious and staying on top of stuff and, you know, the, the industry that we're in, um, you know, really thinking big canvas about, you know, who are we as a community, as a human community, and what kinds of stories do I want to be telling? It's not the same as it might have been. 10, 20 years ago. It's very different. So this, you know, the slate of films and, 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 and even a TV series that I'm developing now are sort of, um, they're appropriate to who I am and where the world is today. Uh, and I don't think in terms, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't think about people as having an age i've never like I, if someone asked me just to be honest your age i would like like literally have no idea i'm just terrible uh like math was my worst subject and now i know why i can't tell anyone's age um and i feel like i don't even know my own age um i just it's not a metric that i understand i understand enthusiasm i understand dreaming it live it leaning into your dreams i understand optimism I understand 
all of those things. And those are sort of the energies of the, or the, you know, that the, 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 those are the things that really underscore how I approach relationships and projects. And, and I've got, you know, I've got a huge appetite. I've, I'm one of those guys who's, my eyes are a little bit bigger than my tummy. So, you know, I've got, um, I've got my film projects. Um, I'm writing another ma manuscript. Um, I've got a, um, I, I've got some crazy, like I have a property in Idaho that I'm, that I'm redesigning. I have a, um, a, a, a believe it or not, a, a business and I've, I've got a new fragrance. Uh, mm, fashion world. <laughs> and, and, well, it's, it's, it's the beauty yeah, world. Fashion in, the, and beauty. In, in the beauty world. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, not only is it a killer, I mean, people are flipping out about it, but it's, uh, it's not out on the market yet. Oh, I was going to say, I've not heard of it. You didn't tell me what, what is it? Uh, it's uh, no, it's, 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 it's a, it's a farm to bottle essential oils from all over the world. It's just mm -hmm. the nose that we worked with, that we collaborated with to create just the right. And it took a year was, awesome. uh, I mean, he's an Egyptian gentleman, just brilliant. I mean, it's like, it's so elevated. Um, but but the you know then then the innovate the part of me that makes the story so interesting around everything that we do in life because every life is storytelling. If you learn to tell a great story, um, you can work magic, and that is in true in every walk of life. So, in the beauty area, you know, like I have this fragrance, but it's really to me, it's like, what's the innovation? What's the story? What are we doing? Well, it's about self love. Yeah. Everything about this fragrance is about self love. I can build off that, but that's the that's the DNA, and the innovation is a sound frequency that we infuse into the oil to make it even more potent. And we've tested it, and it's not it's actually shocking the results. So we use sound frequency infusions. We we have essential oils from all over the planet. It's wow. like that's interesting. Uh, yeah, but I I mean it's like I guess. I, I say that as an example, but it's really like what lights you up or what lights me up or what lights anybody up, right? If you just, if you continue to like be excited and pursue the things that are yours, that belong to you, uh, and you're not doing them just because it's a livelihood, you're doing them because um, this is like an amazing opportunity that speaks to you, Right. And I think if you just do that, that's how you, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't really ever think in terms of the, that was an interesting question. I, how do I stay relevant? I don't think about whether I'm relevant. I just think of my excitement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I like how you talk about what lights you up. I like how you talk about self love, even in a product, right? Uh, very interesting as that is informing the kind of product you put out there. So let's l really finish out by grounding it in business principles as an entrepreneur, right? Being an entrepreneur, as we know, is certainly a challenge. The, the goal is to problem solve. So what are some of the core principles, uh, past and present now? Uh, I know you have um, a platform, creativeedge.com. Uh, yeah. that you you are pouring back into the community doing so much with with training the next you know and creating a pipeline of 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 next filmmakers writers uh directors producers etc but what have you found are the core principles of being number one a bold entrepreneur and a subset of that achieving success as an entrepreneur uh, once you have that thing you love to do and, and you're putting it out there on the product side of things or service. Mm. Um, that's a great question, Ms. I, I I think, you know, some of it has to do with, oh, golly, I think there's a generosity um, that, that, that we can, we all have the ability to bring to the table. And by that, I mean, being really other focused and but not, not, not just in terms of conversation, but what, what do people need? What do they want to live more fully and successfully into this gift of our life? Um, and if you can help them get there, it's really, you know, this whole idea of give back, give back, give back, you know what, it's totally selfish. It's enlightened selfishness. 
Um, it's that's how I enter the world. I want to help people. It just makes because it makes me feel good about life and I'm excited and seeing people flourish. Um, and I think if you just really, you know, are open to that and generous with people in, 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 in you know, it's about truth telling, about vulnerability, about transparency, about being good hearted, like not to be taken advantage of and not to be naive, but to do it in a very honest way. Um, I think if you let people know who you are, this I see this in Hollywood and outside Hollywood. Oftentimes we're, we're, we're miseducated, you know, in so many areas, social skills, uh, communication, uh, financial literacy, like there's a million ways in which we're miseducated. And one of the, one of them is that we should be busy trying to create a result and diminish the process. But in Hollywood, you see, for example, a lot of writers uh, will rely as a primary tool on sending on a blind query letter. The most impersonal, inefficient thing ever devised. And this is what all writers do. <laughs> Dear stranger, and they usually misspell the name or there's no name. Dear blah, um, log line summary, may I send it? Possibly I'll sign a release, whatever, so-and-so. Um, and that's that's and, and that's that's their business marketing model, and it does not work ever. You know, like yes, there's an exception to every rule. So once in a blue moon, it works, but it doesn't really work. But what's behind that? Like, if you approach someone and say, "I'm going to send you a query, but it's going to be an expected event because I care enough. I have intentionally. I've been intentional." I want to know Miss Uduak. I need to know that she lines up. She's on my top 100 list. She's someone that makes sense for me, given where I want to go and who I am and how I do things. I want to know her. So I'm going to reach out to her and I'm going to be totally generous and honest and, and take up three minutes of her time initially. And, you know, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to put myself out there in a wor in the world and not hide behind a script. Because mm, that's, that's profound. Not hide behind a script. Yeah, writers, you know, no one hires a script, they hire a writer. The painting, well, I was going to say by Basquiat, but of course he's so famous. Uh, but, you know, it, it, let, let's put it back in the day. Basquiat's paintings were absolutely crazy, beautiful, original. Uh, like, I, you, you could almost obsess about them. But when did they become really valuable? For me, it becomes valuable when I know the artist and the artist's story. The artist comes first. All of us come first. I don't care if you're in business and in insurance, storytelling, I don't care, we come first. And if we learn that, if we can master and get out of our own way to be able to share who we are and why we choose to do what we do, and why am I so deeply connected? What's the connective tissue between me and what's in this script or this book or this project? Why do I care this much? And why could no one else have done it the way I, with what I've brought to it? Um, you start to talk to the world that way. And it literally sets the table in a different way. You're inviting people and being other focused and saying, so that's, you know, before I'm not, I, Everyone I know is calling your office, trying to brush past you to get to your boss. And I don't want to. I want you to be really clear. I just want to talk to you right now. Absolutely. 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 Uh, How do we get out of, out of our own way? I like that you said that. How do we do that? As business owners, as talents, as those advising um, the, the talents, et cetera, just all around, whether you're talking from the entrepreneur side or, or the talent side. Um, how do you, or sometimes both, right? Yeah. I, I, I think the shortest answer I can give you and probably the, the truest one is, you know, stop operating from here. Hmm. This is hmm. like, you know, it's a beautiful thing, this mind that we've been given. But I think if we trust our gut and our heart and our spirit, solar plexus and our, you know, like if, if we trust ourselves and we, and, 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 you know, on every level, emotionally, spiritually, 
Um, I, Psychologically, I think, mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of it, all of it. I think if we do, uh, we'll make choices that are better choices that will save us a lot of ang anguish uh, and frustration. Um, and, and we'll be, look, everybody's looking for a leader. There's something about us. We just want to be inspired by someone who is a leader and talks to us in a way that's not common. That's what makes them stand out. And we all have the choice and the ability to be that in some measure every day of our lives if we speak that deeper truth. And that's that to me is getting out of, it's, you know, when I say getting out of our own way, it's like, let me get out of my head and get into the truth of who I am and what I'm doing. Amazing, Gary. So two final questions. Since you talk about uh, we all like to be inspired by leaders, what leader inspires you? Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> the people... who are, people are her, heroic enough, courageous enough to truly live what is theirs to do and not following others, not comparing themselves to others, not worrying about any of that, um, who are liberated and, and, and who are motivated by doing good in the world. I mean, I, there was a, it's funny, a friend of mine asked me a question recently. Um, what is it that makes people want to be heroes? And I, and, and my answer was number one, I don't think heroes want to be heroes. I don't, I don't think it works the math that doesn't work. That yeah. But there was an old quote uh, from Bob Dylan of all people, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it was something like this. Um, Heroes are those who embrace the responsibility that comes with our freedom. It was a really interesting take on what it is to be mm, internally okay. heroic. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to think about it first. Yeah, second. exactly. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. you're, I know you're a poet, so time out. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I mean, there's the, the, the people who who just have, they see over the hedgerow, they see a big vision, they see, an, they have an embrace for humanity that's abnormally large. Um, and they cause, you know, for one person, a barefoot little man named Gandhi to do what he did um, and not care what people thought. And by the way, against, you know, we, th we, we think oh, people are we we think we live in a cancel culture today he was the first right or one of them right it's like uh, um but people who are so steadfast in who they are and what they're here to do and do it with uh, sort of a um uh, gosh i you know i i don't want to with 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 heart with vigor with with kindness with without judgment uh, that to me is like a level of humanity that we all have to constantly and consistently aspire to and remind ourselves about. The possibility is real. We just have to choose it incrementally, day by day, get better. Yeah, I like that it's not also a specific leader you're, you're particularly identifying that inspires you, but the qualities and character of what you want to see in a leader that inspires you. That is awesome. So let me wrap it up with, I've talked about Creative Edge. Um, I really, really liked going to the website, seeing the layout, seeing what you were doing. We didn't really get to talk much about your book, but maybe tie that into, because it's previously written. I know you said you're working on something else, a manuscript, I think. Uh, but, yeah. Okay, Let's... so if you could tie it into um, what Creative Edge is all about, and maybe even give a... Uh, a little synopsis of, of your book. I was getting ready to, to get in here and, and just briefly with the group on uh, Clubhouse mentioned, I got to come for this interview and someone on stage was, was actually reading your book. He said he was reading it. So I said, wow, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about um, Creative Edge and then tie just a little bit into the book that you wrote for those who might be interested to get all that knowledge 
in, in one place uh, to guide their careers. Yeah, in a, in a nutshell, Ms. Urek, it was very simply that, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of my adulthood, um, whether it was an attorney or manager or what have you, or even as a producer, really like um, helping people get where they wanted to go. You know, and 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 so especially after all those, you know, the dozen years that I was a lit manager and 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 had some good results launching a lot of careers, it's and mine mine included. Um, I kept getting asked, as I'm sure you do all the time, how do you do this? How do you break into Hollywood? How do you succeed in life? How do you? And so um, I was, you know, my dad taught me you you make yourself available, you 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 help people, and you. But I suddenly I saw a third of my calendar was just all these one hour conversations in person or over coffee or over social media or whatever. Yeah. It was like and, and and the worst part was not only a third of my life, but I was boring the you know what out of myself. <laughs> I like I wanted to shoot me. And so um, I finally said, you know what, I'm going to go to the the this was years ago. So uh, in 2013, I published the book. So I guess I thought of this in about 2011. It took me a couple of years to write it and publish it, et cetera. But so back then, um, 10 years or so ago, when I started with this idea, it was like, I'm going to go out in the bookstores, the specialty bookstores that still existed back then, and the internet, and I'm going to find the book. And then when people ask me, I'm going to say, hey, read this book. And if you still have questions, call me. Great. <laughs> and I couldn't find it. There are thousands of teachers teaching craft, like how to how do you write a better script, deliver a better performance, director, producer, cinema, you know, DP a better film. No one was talking about career. They were all talking craft. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I thought, oh darn, okay. So I'm gonna write this book because I don't see it. It doesn't seem to exist. So I wrote the book with the idea that I was gonna whittled down to just the tried and the truth that all of the tactics, the simple tactics that I used um, every day to launch careers. And the, the mat, I had this math. So back when I was managing, I knew I couldn't have more than 15 clients max at any point in time. Why? Because I needed to invest absolutely 30 minutes a day on every single client. So if I worked, you know, I could work 10, 12 hours, but at least I knew that, you know, seven and a half of those hours, each client got half an hour of my time. And then everything else was everything else, right? Um, and, and I really, and I saw that that works. And it's baby steps, just baby steps every day. If you know what to do with those 30 minutes. So I, I, so I thought, okay, I'm going to just chunk all this down. I'm going to put it in a book. I put it in a book. Conquering Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, anyway, so that was it. So when people called me and said, hey, how do I do this? I could say, great. Yeah, here's my book. <laughs> read the book, read the book. Um, yeah. And then if you have questions, call me later. But I'm, thank you. You know, that's now the conversation is going to start way downfield. Um, but then people would read the book and they said, oh, this is great. This is game changing. I've never heard this stuff. Thank you. It's like, oh, awesome. And they would always end the, or not always, but most would end the conversation with, so now what do I do? Mm. And I was like, oh gosh, that wasn't the reaction I was hoping for. Okay. Exactly. So, so, but then I thought about it and I realized, no, you're right. Um, when your nose is pressed up against the glass and it's so personal, uh, it's really hard to sort that out and know what to do on your own behalf. So I thought, okay, I'm going to take all this stuff, which is true and it works, but I'm going to put it in the form of a, an eight module masterclass where mm -hmm. um, I'm going to force the individual to do these exercise driven workbooks section by section so that they end up with a roadmap. They actually have answered the questions that they had at the end of reading the book. Um, now, it, but you know, the book tells them the the concept, the context. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But now it's about application. Now it's the about practical application of it. Yeah, really ground it in some reality. Mm -hmm. um, so that was why I created the master class, and you know, I mean, I, I, it's on the website. I, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I do, you know, there's a ridiculous high price on it. I do things all the time with writer organizations uh, here and 
in Australia and all over the place. So it's not about that. It's, it's really just about when, create, when people choose to be a creative professional, um, the world suddenly looks very random and mysterious. It's like being in a dark forest. You hear sounds. You don't know which way to turn. Um, as if no one's ever put their foot, footprint in the sand before. As, as if you're the first person ever to do it. And it's not true. It's mm -hmm. a business. And I needed to make that, like I needed to do a primer that, that could be a roadmap of sorts and explain to people, like, how do you get so that you're not in competition with anyone. You know, you just get out of that mindset and it's part of its tactics and part of its mindset. And you can, you can save yourself a lot of time and a, and a lot of angst. Um, Absolutely. It, yeah. So that was what's behind it. Awesome. And it's creativeedge.com, right? Is, is that yeah. correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Gary, thank you so much. We could go on and on. Uh, that was just a tip of, of uh, just a scratch on the surface. We definitely uh, didn't even go as deep as I'd like to, but we only have so much time. We are busy professionals. We have other things to do. So I have to invite you to come back with other projects that you may have that we can talk about and delve into. Well, thank you better you, be, you better you better be careful because next time I, I may turn it all around and interview you. Sure. Absolutely. 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 But thank you so much for your time, for the information. I really, really loved hearing the story of that background and, and the steps you've taken to get to where you are. And I think particularly for me, why it stands out is sometimes, um, you know, you could have gone to the Stanford, et cetera, but you chose deliberately different pathway. And I think a lot of people can resonate with that, even down to the school and getting into to law school, especially for law students that might watch this. And you still go on and do so well. There's a, an attorney I've uh, interviewed on the podcast, Dina Lapolt. I don't know if you're familiar with her, a music lawyer, represents some of the biggest names uh, in, the, in the industry. And what's so interesting about her story is she went to a California accredited law school, John F. Kennedy in Walnut Creek. But today is one of the biggest names, you know, in the industry. So really, it, the story can go anywhere and, and can, can can just, it really is that personal belief, that determination, perseverance, consistency, keeping the eye on the price and, and staying at it. And you exemplify every single thing. And I love how introspective you are. It's such, it's so heartwarming for me to, to listen to you um, talk. It, it's never from a place of, 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 the surface it, it it has layers upon layers that gives you food for thought if you are willing to to really uh, open your mind and listen so thank you so much i appreciated having you on enjoyed had a great time please stay in the green room i'm going to put you back in the green room uh as i close this out so we can chat very briefly okay, okay. wonderful thank you so much thank you thank you thank you all right, folks, that's it. It was an amazing, amazing time. Thank you. We will be back next week. I'm so excited about my guest next week. Give me one second. Let me get uh, this particular thing I want to show. Okay, so I'm so excited about my guest next week, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I've been trying to get her since 2019, and often I don't necessarily stay on it like that, but she had um, some crazy schedules, traveling all over the world, working with political campaigns, et cetera. She's a media communication expert, and I can't wait for what she's going to bring to the table as well. This interview was amazing. Tune in next week, and we'll see you on Sunday. In the meantime, have a great, fantastic week, uh, a weekend, whenever you watch this ahead, and um, take care. Cheers.